All right, well, up next, best-selling author Betty Fussell talks theater, food, and hunting. Oh, yes, and we'll be talking about writing. Up next. Hi, and welcome to the Ozzy Osbourne Radio Show. I'm your host, William J. Bruce III. With me on the line is Betty Fussell. Now, you're the author of 11 books, is that correct? Yes. Wow. Can you name a few of them? Yes. I'm, the people who know me at all know me for the story of corn. That is, corn, the corn on the cob sort of thing, okay. and which really turned out to be the history of the New World. I didn't know that when I started, but that's what it ended up. So I had a wonderful time in the 1980s running all over North and Middle and South America. And Middle America, that is Mexico, is where corn began. And it's as old as rice or wheat. So when we call the Western Hemisphere the New World, it is very mistaken. It's just a European view, as which was, we named the Old World. Okay. So, uh, what, like, when did you discover your passion for writing? I think when I wrote my first book, which is about a silent movie star named Mabel, um, subtitle, Hollywood's First I Don't Care Girl. And I was interested in her because I'm a total movie nut from childhood, okay. and I'm also a total drama nut. Those two things go together. Mabel was the first girl, the first comic actress created by the movies. Everybody else came from vaudeville. Mary Pickford, etc. Mabel was a totally Hollywood creature and lived a totally early Hollywood life, which means, you know, Hollywood was just beginning with Max Sennett and D.W. Griffith and all these people who had moved from the East. So it was still, it was really Wild West time. And accordingly, they made up their own rules and kicked up their heels and... Poor darling Mabel was a victim of fame and drugs, <laughs> that is coke, and um, booze, gin. Essentially, she din gin did her in at age 29, okay. about two years after I was born. So I sort of love this transition. Hmm. So, um, I, I, cause I, I know you had done um, books more like your earlier writing was more about theater and film. Why the, the transition to food? Was there a, a reason? It's really by accident, but it's also serendipity because cooking and eating is really a form of performance. You're performing for yourself. Even if you're eating alone, it's you and me and myself. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm... And I and me and myself, and we are eating together, uh, we are performing, we are have the table can be set for one, it's still a performance. So for me, eating is theater and has always been. It's a ritual. Okay. And we bring to it everything we bring to theater. That's cool. That's an interesting look on that. Uh, was becoming a writer, was it? like more of a desire or was it like a realization? Well, translate those words for me. I really don't understand. Those words okay. are too hard. Okay. <laughs> Make it simpler. Okay. Did uh, I want to become a writer? Right. Was it something that you wanted to be or was it one day you, you just noticed a, a gifting in it? No, because I never was gifted. Okay. It was hard, bloody work. Unlike my husband who was a gifted writer who and my best friend had been born with a facility for words. I did not. So I had to work for everything I did in writing, except I'd always, you know, there's so many different kinds of writing. And as a, as a kid, I loved to scribble down little ditties and draw pictures. Now, that's all part of the same world. Right. But it's not expository prose, which I was not good at. And it was really and remains hard for me. Okay. I'm an image person entirely. That's why I love movies. Image first. Put the image into words. Metaphor. I work by what metaphor. 
Poetry is a lot easier than prose for me. Okay. Uh, now, also, like, um, you know, you, you speak of it being, you know, bloody hard. Um, did being a female writer, especially earlier on, what was that something that you had to work against? Um, well, earlier on means within my lifetime, right. but that really covers a lot of the 20th century. <laughs> so when I started writing academic stuff, because I was had gone to graduate school, when my husband went to graduate school at Harvard, so okay, this is uh, a, 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 an academic life, and then I became a faculty wife. When I first submitted articles, I had to submit them as B.H. Fussell. Nobody would have printed an article on T.S. Eliot by somebody whose name was Betty. And that was my real name, so I wasn't going to change it to Elizabeth. And yeah. yes, I mean, women couldn't even become professors at any of the Ivy Leagues in the United States. Nor in, a, you know, the, the British tradition. No, this is male-dominated. The writing comes in the same drawer. So it took huge, huge changes in that same 20th century. I think it's the most, certainly it was an explosive century in every possible way, literally so and metaphorically. Okay. How, how were you able to, to deal with that? I, I would assume that that would be a, a frustrating thing. Well, it's frustrating for everybody if yeah. you don't understand quite why whatever you do doesn't count. Yeah. to the people you are with in a male-dominated society, which is the way, uh, you know, which has been the tradition of the Western culture, but not of the East. That's interesting. So, you know, Westerners, we and it's, again, very much indebted to the British tradition. Hierarchies and Victorianism, and ironically now, with Brexit, you know, Britain is both a symbol of this very old, entrenched Victorian kind of culture, empirical, uh, empire style. At the same time, it's the only monarchy left <laughs> as a queen. Right. So the contradictions abound, and they are a great deal of fun. So never, whenever you talk about gender and the history of, you know, it is fun because we're all speculating about what cavemen and what cave women did with these differences. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, uh, I'll just sort of transition on. Uh, what was your springboard? Uh, what, what was the thing that gave you the your, your big break? Um, to speak frankly, yeah. divorcing, separating from my husband, divorcing him. Okay. And, and remember, he was a writer. Right, so yeah. <laughs> there's nothing, I mean, no woman could write, period. And he was very much uh, uh, mm, a Victorian child and a Victorian grown-up. Okay. So I had to, in effect, free myself from his constant presence. And the ghosts that a whole lot of people have to free themselves from, mothers or fathers or parents or friends, you know, all those voices that say, no, you're no good, you can't write. Okay. Go off by yourself and go to it and try it and try it and try it. Amen. Practice, practice, practice. If you get to Carnegie Hall, fine. If you don't, you've done your best to get there. Amen. Did, was it something like where he was keeping you in, in the shadows or was it just, um, what, what, what was it that was freeing about it? If you live for yourself alone, narcissistic style, right. there's only room for one on the stage. Only one. That's true. Doesn't matter who the others are. You know. That's true. Yeah. Wives, children, friends, you know. No, no, no. There's only one. <laughs> and if you're that kind of guy or, or that kind of woman, but, you know, guys are, are encouraged to be that way, uh, then there's just no room for anybody. So you just um, get rid of them. Put them, keep them in the wings, in the shadows. Yeah, yeah. Um, what's distinct in, in the way that you write? Well, I learned this by, by doing, God knows, because I really wanted to write books okay. rather than journalism. Journalism was a way to get to books, give me time for books. So okay. for a decade, uh, really 50s and 60s, I was doing journalism. 
and didn't get to start a book until 1970s and then published my first one in 1982. That was the Mabel. Okay. Uh, I discovered that the only way I could write was to write in first-person voice. Okay. That is, it had to sieve through me. It had to be my point of view, and I had to be right out there saying, uh, with corn. I became a personal story about my family from the Midwest and what corn meant to them and what we had, what I had as a kid. I always have to make the connection. If I don't, uh, I can't write it. So I'm not a good objective writer about anything. My, my voice is a camera, and I'm behind the camera, and I let everybody know it. Yeah. Um, now, with, with journalism, because you, you, you mentioned journalism, did you ever find it to be sort of a, a catch-22? Uh, like something like you're, you're getting into journalism so you can, you know, write and perhaps get onto books, but then get so busy with journalism that you can't write the book? You, have you ever had that sort yes, of... Yes, I mean, and that's always a danger, particularly after you get good at the journalism. Yeah. But I am forever indebted to journalism because that's what got me out of the kind of language I detest in academic prose. <laughs> it's abstract, it's Latinate, it's pretentious, it's a covering, it's jargon. You yeah. Know? yeah, for sure. And I was always fighting that. And not until I started to work for the New York Times and was assigned, of all things, restaurant reviews. Okay, that's a hundred and... Um, how many was it? No, that was 75... 75 words? That didn't sound enough. Let's say 150 words... Per column, period. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Once a week. Oh, and if you've not done that before, good God, invaluable. Yeah. Invaluable. Yes. A, you have to have something to say. B, you have to have it there in the first sentence, and then, and and with the conclusion already in your head. Yeah. Everything in between has to count toward that, and I love it. It's like a quick scene in a movie, and then it's over, until yeah. the next one. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, what's your, your biggest hindrance as a writer? Um, not knowing where I'm going. Okay. Or what I'm doing. <laughs> or what I really want to say. Yeah. I think those are universals. Yeah. Not having a clear enough view. If you can't state what you want to say in a paragraph, even if it's going to be a 400-page book, you haven't got it yet. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And everything has to, and I've done a lot of workshop writing, workshop teaching, and I'm dismayed by people, you know, th and it's a natural mistake, but beginning writers think, oh my God, uh, what am I going to cut out? I mean, you know, every word I've thought about, what can I cut? It's not what can you cut, it's what do you select to begin with? Right. Selection, selection. Hmm. It's very interesting uh, insight. Um, how how do you overcome that yourself when you're in that position? By trying things out. You yeah. work at it, and you know, yeah. write the piece. Write the piece. Don't just think about it. Put it down on paper, and look at it. That's and good. if you're not writing for a reader, you're not writing. Yeah, man. Think of your reader, you know, you've got to connect to somebody. Right, exactly. Nothing makes me more impatient than people who write poems for themselves to express themselves. That's fine. <laughs> but then don't expect to get that, don't push that out into public. Right. Write your poem for somebody. Yeah. Then it works. Yeah, that's true. It's but not about self-expression. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what activities uh, or routines or, or rituals uh, do do you do to like? What what helps you to get writing? Is it just uh, to get moving? Yeah, is it just button chair? Focus and start time, moving? focus time, creating focused time. It's the hardest I think for everybody, and it's massively more difficult when mm, the internet is at your <laughs> at your fingertips. Yes. And the, the possibilities of distraction are getting lost forever in the iCloud, as we all do. Google, 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 one thing leads to another. Or, oh, there's the iPhone, there's the telephone, there's the, uh, you know. 
This is a great hindrance. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I sort of envy the, uh, the, the older time uh, for, for that reason, because I, I find that myself. And, um, I'm, everybody does. But, yeah. And it doesn't matter what art it is, I mean, whether it's music or, or painting or whatever. Yeah. It's got to be, you've got to lose yourself in the, in the process or you ain't there. Yeah, amen to that. Uh, what what's your what were your influences growing up as a kid? What what inspired you to to want to write? Movies, movies, movies. movies. Yes. We didn't live. I didn't have a, a house of books. Okay. My parents, and my family, they were they were all on the science side. So there were textbooks, biology and botany and anatomy, but there was zero fiction, or poetry or anything else. But there was the Bible, a great thing. Yeah. And I used the public library. God bless the public library. <laughs> Amen to that. Yeah, for sure. And that that was my source of books and the comics in the newspaper. Really? Oh, absolutely. Wow. Comedy is Emmy. I mean, the comics are a great genre. I'm so glad we now have graphic novels done in comic form. Yes. Yes, for sure. Uh, who do you look up to for? Like, is there any writers that um, today sort of inspire you? Oh, of course. I mean, I'm always I'm in awe. There's so many good ones. Uh, but I'm going, but I like, uh, now the trouble is, my eyes are going fast, so oh, I don't no. get to read fiction easily. And that's for two reasons. One, my own ADD is increased with the, uh, the Internet. Okay. And it's, my attention is much, much shorter. I cannot sit down and read a Dickens novel anymore. Right. I can't read any 19th century novel. Even Jane Austen seems a little long. You know? Really? So it's, I have to, uh, I, I like writers that get my attention and keep it okay. uh, quickly. Okay. And that's a whole range, but it also has to be in more and more, like many other people, uh, I like nonfiction because it's, it, it can relate quicker. And that imaginative world that, the fiction provides. I'm afraid I really do get out of movies like or serials like Game of Thrones. Yeah. So uh, I'm nuts about so many TV series. They really have supplanted for me the whole need for fiction. Yeah. Um, you had said something that that uh, makes me think. Uh, you had mentioned about how just the the lack of. Um, being able to concentrate, you know, uh, just in general because of internet, you know, with everybody, um, yep. our, with all of our toys today. Do you think that that's going to change uh, writing itself in regards to... Well, it already has. Yeah, but I mean... Like, it already has. It's, 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 changed, it's changed structure. I mean, yeah. we're all really heading to... Uh, we're all heading toward, toward tweets. Tweets yeah. and blogs. And I love, I love the, uh, you know, 75 characters. Is that what it is? Yeah, something uh, like that, yeah. Because they are like haikus. It it is comp they got it. It's got to be compressed, etc. I mean, I like those little kernels, and those will evolve their own mosaic structures. That's true. Which again are primarily visual. Right. Yeah, because and I'm fascinated by that because we are heading. I mean, the iCloud is a visual world. It is not an oral world. World. Right. That's very true, yeah, because everything's getting shorter as a result. Shorter, and then this is the real globalization. This is Esperanto. This is, the images are the primary communicative symbol. Yeah. Um, going back to your, your cooking, um, sorry, I forgot to ask this question, but um, where did your interest in cooking begin? Cooking began at a, we had zero good food. I grew up with really god awful blah cornmeal yeah. mush and post them, yeah. literally. <laughs> uh, and because food was despised, which is not unusual, this is a Victorian heritage. Okay. Food reminds us of our animal selves, and our bodies are to be despised because we are not animals, we are creatures of light saved by God. You know, this yeah. huge distinction. So just get rid of all the body. Get rid of anything that goes into the body with colonic irrigations. Therefore, Kellogg's Sanitarium, the whole 19th century. Uh, 
nuts and berries crowd of health, which we have lots of funny, ironic hangovers of. But then it was get rid of everything, turn it into liquid, and get rid of it as quickly as possible. There are still hangovers of this. With uh, the many of my peers at 80s come from the generation where you never talked about food, as you didn't talk about money at table because it was a low subject. Well, that has changed radically, thank God. So yeah. now food is as chic as fashion is. Yes. And that's kind of an extraordinary change. And so men pride themselves on their pastries and their, as well as their steaks. Well, what a wonderful thing, you know. Yeah. Uh, but that's a radical change. So when I began to cook, it was because we were poor graduate students and if I didn't cook, we didn't eat because we couldn't afford anything, except Chinese, and you get very tired of Chinese. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So I learned, And I learned to cook uh, with books, buy books, because I happened to be having to learn to cook for the first time uh, when, Julia, when the Julia Child explosion came. Yes. And Julia and Jim Speard and MFK Fisher and Craig Claiborne. Ooh, ah, these were intelligent people. Yowie, so you could talk about food as well as uh, learn to do it and it required an art and a craft and oh this is fun so okay so i understand that you uh have done some hunting well i'm not a hunter no i, I know. went hunting twice with my son in my big fork montana yes and this career this hunting career <laughs> didn't begin until i was 85 <laughs> wow Okay. And half blind with glaucoma, and I never shot a gun before, and I was living in New York City. Really? Now, so how do I learn to shoot a gun? Yes. My son was very careful about requiring me to know what I'm doing, which he's right. So I went to, I lived in Greenwich Village, and I went to a neighborhood Target thing, room in a basement, which is where evidently the local police go for Target practice. Really? Wow. <laughs> and there I learned how to load a gun. I learned to, what a bullet was and how to put it into the gun and learned how to sight the target. And then I went to Big Fork, Montana, and my training, all it was was it, my training did me no good. I did know what a gun and a bullet was, but now suddenly I had this great big rifle that was so heavy I couldn't hold it. <laughs> wow. Um, so Sam had to, son Sam had to make a branch that had a kind of fork in it that I could rest the gun on. Well, this is all an extraordinary feat of leisure domain on his part. Wow, yeah. But I got my deer. I got my deer in one shot because I was so well trained. He told me just where to hit it. And so that my deer, my doe, my darling doe, its beautiful skin rests upon my bed and its skull is mounted on the wall, and I ate everything that was edible about it. That was the good part. That's called earning her food. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So are you still hunting? No. The second time I went hunting <laughs> was to hunt coyotes with Sun Sam on Thanksgiving Day in Montana when it was snowy and icy. Now, Sam, at six foot four, could fall down and just get up and spring on up the mountain a tra a trail we were on. But me, I slipped and broke my ankle. Not good. No. He had to lug me down the mountain trail like a bear carcass on his back. So I think that has ended my hunting day. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. And we didn't get the coyote because they weren't out yet. We was, it was dark in the dawn, you know, before dawn. Wow. Wow. Hey guys, thank you for tuning into the Ozzy Osbourne Radio Show. For more episodes, you can check out OzzyOsbourne.com. That's A-U-S-S-I-E Osbourne.com.